Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Mr. Wiz here. If you are new to this channel, we build video games. We have a lot of fun doing that. So we've already spent a lot of time learning how to build games, and now we're working on extensions and how to use them to make our games more professional, more finished, maybe even do some things that we would have trouble doing without them. So today we're going to be looking at a grid extension. Before we get into that, let me talk about what's going on behind me right now. So before I recorded, started recording, I threw together this little program that is a Frogger style program where the player is that little duck there. And of course the goal is to cross without getting hit. Now I did not finish this game. I only, I only spent maybe a half an hour, uh, probably I guess closer to 40 minutes from the looks of it here building this. So it's not a finished game. This is really just a prototype um, where the idea is to cross the road. And I made it so that if I sit on a log, I float along with the log, and then I get to the end, right? So, of course, obviously, this game was inspired by Frogger, one of my favorite games pl to play growing up. The reason I built it is because I feel like Frogger is a great example of a grid-style video game. So, as you notice right now, I'm just gliding around. It doesn't really feel like Frogger, because in Frogger, you don't glide, you hop. You go from square to square, basically. So this easy, simple gliding movement doesn't really do this game justice. So we're going to look at how to use the grid extension to improve this game and make it feel more like the original Frogger game. So before I do that, let me just show you real quick the code that I made. I created the tile map the way that I normally do using a size 10 by 8, so it would be the same size as the screen. I set up the sprite. I did change its depth. The reason I did that is so that he would be in front of the logs when I sit on them. If I had not done that, he would have actually appeared behind the logs. So to make it look like the duck was on the log, I changed his depth. Um, I changed his scale and also the scale of the logs to make them a little bit smaller so that they weren't the same size as the cars. I felt like that just fit the game better. The logs were originally very thick, too big. So we made the logs smaller and I made the duck also smaller using the scale. Um, you use the Y position just to put it at the bottom of the screen, gave it regular movement controls, which we'll be changing in a little bit here. So here's where I created the cars and the logs. I just set them up as regular projectiles, same way I did in the lessons where I taught you guys how to do projectiles, right? The only difference is uh, after creating the projectiles and creating their speed with direction, I placed them on a starting tile. So the red cars always start at this tile, the blue cars always start at this tile, so on and so forth. Um, I did make this car image myself, taking an existing car, copying the back of it, making it larger. So I just edited an image from the gallery to make that long limo kind of car. Um, same thing with the logs. The logs were great, but they don't actually come with an end. So I had to edit them to create an end to the logs. So I have three different size logs here. The only difference between how I coded the logs and how I coded the cars is I did change their kind. So the logs, instead of being a projectile kind, they are a log kind. I did that because in my game, I want the player to be able to ride on the logs, right? If he gets hit by a car, he should die, but he should be able to ride on the logs. The logs are a good thing, not a bad thing, right? Okay, so I've done all that. And of course, as I mentioned, I already changed their scale. And then over here, to make the player float on the log, I made an overlap code for when the player overlaps with the log, set the players, VX, to that log's VX. So the player's velocity in the X direction matches the log's velocity, and that allows me to float down the river with them. And then I created these two overlap codes, so when I get off of the log, the velocity goes back to zero and I stop moving in that direction. Before I coded this, what happened is once I got off the log, I was still moving. So this kind of helps prevent that. So as you can see here, I move around, everything's good. If I hop on a log, I float with it, and when I get off the log, I stop moving, right? So that's what I have coded so far, and that just gives me a very basic prototype of a Frogger-style game. I have not built damage into this yet, so as you can tell, I'm standing in the water, and I'm not dying. Um, I'm getting hit by cars, and I'm not dying because I haven't coded that part of the game yet. You should be able to figure out how to do that on your own using the skills that you've learned in the lessons. If you've never taken my lessons... Now would be a great time to go check them out. There's quite a few. There's about a 30 videos teaching different ways to build games in Make Code Arcade. I would highly recommend you check those out if you haven't taken them yet. Okay, so let's look at the extension we're going to be using today. In the extension area, 
If you scroll down, we've done so many extensions, but there's still a lot more to go. The one we're looking at is the one called Sprite Grid, the Sprite Grid extension. Basically, what the Sprite Grid extension does is it turns your game into a grid style game. So tile maps have tiles. We've used tile maps before, but what the Sprite Grid does is it treats the tiles as squares in your game. If you think about, there's a lot of grid games that exist that are not video games. Games like Checkers uses a grid, right? Chess uses a grid. Um, Battleship uses a grid, right? So there's a lot of games like that that use grids. You don't see those a lot in video games, but you can absolutely build those types of games in video games. And this is a great extension if you wanted to do something like that. So we're going to go ahead and download the extension now by clicking on it. Once I click on it, it adds it as a new section in the toolbox right here. And these are the blocks that I can use. So there's several here. They're not really that complicated. So we have one that snaps the player to a grid and we have one that removes the player from the grid. So these essentially put you on one of the tiles. It sets you to a tile, which is essentially the, what the grid is. It's basically just the tile. So right now my player is not on a specific tile. If I give him this block, it will snap him onto the closest tile. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that. So right now he's at the bottom of the screen, but he's not on a tile. I'm going to put this in here and this will snap him to the closest tile which we can see is actually right there. So he's a little bit lower, a little bit harder to see, but he is right now in the middle of a tile. He's on the grid. Removing, same idea. That just takes you off of the grid and allows you to move freely. Then we have this one, which places you on top of a particular tile. So if I didn't want him there, if I wanted him starting somewhere else, I could use this and I could place him on a particular tile using column and row. Just a reminder, if you ever need to figure out the column and row of a square, just put your mouse over where you want him to go. So if I want him to spawn right here in the bottom left corner, right here next to where it says 10 and 8, look right next to that. And you'll see as I move my mouse, those numbers change. So if I wanted him to start right here, I would set him on 5, 7, which actually is a pretty good place. So let's change that. Instead of doing snap to grid, we will just put him on the 5, 7 mark. So we're going to place my sprite on top of column and row five and seven. And that's also kind of snapping him to the grid because it's putting him on that tile, right? He's now on that grid space. Okay. So after these, you have movement. So this is where it really starts playing out. Move, uh, grid move with buttons. So right now he has regular move with buttons, which allows him to move freely throughout the game. And that's what's kind of making this game not feel like Frogger for me right now, right? So I'm going to get rid of the regular move with buttons and I'm going to replace it with the grid move with buttons. Now when he moves, he will be moving tile by tile. He'll be moving one space at a time, just like you would in a game of checkers or something of that effect, right? So here we go. As I move left and right, you can see he's kind of hopping. If I go up, He's hopping square to square. So he is moving along tile by tile, grid by grid. And I'm going to go ahead and put him on a log, and that part is still working. Okay, so I ran into my first bug. Did you guys see that? If I hop him on a log and then I get off the log, it puts him back where he was before. The reason it's doing that is because it's still imagining him as being locked on the grid. So when I move up, even though his velocity is moving him this way, the computer is still thinking of him as being on the left side there. So when I go down, I'm going down to the square below me. It's still imagining that I'm on that grid space. So let's fix that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to grid, and I'm going to grab that remove from grid. So when I hop on a log, I want it removing me from the grid. And that should give me the freedom to be able to hop off of it again. So let's try it now. So I'm going to move up. I'm going to hop on this log. And then if I come down, I go down to where I was. Boom, boom. And it's working. Because it's temporarily removing me from the grid while it's floating on the log. 
I'm no longer on the grid. Now, when I start moving left and right again, because I'm using move with grid controls, when I move, it puts me back on the grid. Does that make sense? So I'm only temporarily off the grid. I'm off the grid as long as I'm floating down the river. But once I start using my arrow keys again, it puts me back on the grid. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, let's look at the other squares here. So there's move with buttons we already did. There's swap. Okay, so let's imagine that you're building a game that's almost like a board game, maybe. Um, something of that effect. You may have a scenario since each grid, since each tile is its own square, its own space, you may not want to have two sprites on the same square. So this allows you to swap them. So maybe if a player steps on a spot that someone else is on, they can switch places. Or maybe you have something else in your game that allows people to switch places. You know, I don't know the rules of your game. But yeah, this allows you to swap two sprites locations so they end up on each other's tiles, which is kind of cool. Move sprite by column and rows. This is exactly what you would think it is. It's just moving you a certain number of rows, certain number of squares. Um, so, you know, maybe you are building a chess style game, which would be pretty complicated, but you could do. You might want to make it so that it moves in an L shape, it moves forward so many rows and then to the left one. I don't know. You could do stuff like that if you wanted to. Now, this is an individual. It only happens once at a time, right? So you may need to put this inside of a button press or something else. Maybe instead of using grid move with buttons, maybe you don't want to use that at all. And you want to use on button press for left, right, up, down. And you want them to move different grids depending on whether you go left, right, up, or down. So that's, you know, an option for you. Um, down here for location, these are just regular bubbles that you can put inside of other blocks. I, you know, pretty straightforward, very similar to what you're used to over here where we have my sprites X and Y. Same idea, except you're using columns and rows, right? And you can also set up something and add columns and rows. So an example of what you might do for this, maybe you want the sprite to place something that's in front of them. Maybe with a button press, they drop an object in front of them. So you could set, when you have it drop, you could set its location at the location of the sprite plus a certain number of columns and rows. You could do that, right? So those are just bubbles you can use in blocks you already have or already familiar with. Arrays uh, obviously are a little bit more advanced, but it helps you keep track of things that are going on in your game, right? So you could have an array of all the sprites in the grid. You could have an array of sprites of certain squares. I particularly like the ones that allow you to count in rows or in columns. So for instance, if I was to make a finished Frogger game, in the normal Frogger game, you had objects at the end that you were trying to collect, right? There would be, I think, about five objects back here. So if I was making this a finished Frogger game, I would want the game to keep track of how many of these were back here. And then maybe once I collect them all, so once the sprites on this back row equals a certain amount, so once I collect them all, I guess it would be zero. Well, and then I could have the game end or the level change or something like that. So yeah, honestly, not that hard to work with. I would definitely recommend if you're going to build any games that are boards, board game style games, this is a great extension to use. If you want to do something Frogger like or Crossy Roads like, which is what the kids nowadays call it because there was a, a knockoff. Um, so yeah, you could totally do that with the grid. Completely up to you. If you do build something using the grid extension, of course, you know, I'm going to want to see it, right? So click on that share link, copy your link, put it in the comments. I want to see what you build with this extension. All right. That's going to be all from me today. If you learned something new, please click that like button. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. Don't forget to tell other people about this channel so they can come and build fun games as well. I'll see you guys next time.